All right, Lurch, yeah. we have not mentioned this before. Uh, we've mentioned it in videos, uh, but we have not done it on a podcast yet. Uh, we like to mention things that uh, we've tested a little bit longer term and something that we can recommend to you all. So you may have seen it in some of our videos, but I want to mention it here. These are our beloved torque wrenches. So on these bad boys, uh, Lurch and I got these a little over a year ago. Um, we had toyed with a bunch of different torque wrenches. We had a couple craftsmen. Some of the mechanical ones that make the clicking noise and yes. some others. Yeah. I had a digital craftsman, then that one broke and I replaced it. I haven't been very happy with that. Uh, most you, the just, other, you just wanted a reason to buy more tools. That's a fact. That's a fact. Uh, so I found these bad boys and, I, you know, mostly a lot of craftsman stuff we use and some obviously other brands, but I saw these and so I ordered them up. And uh, like I said, we've had them in our hands over a year now and I'll let Lurch speak to him because he actually uses them more than me. I film, but these are the AC Delco uh, RM601 and this little kit that I'm going to tell you about comes with a heavy duty digital torque wrench combo kit with buzzer and LED flash notification. Now, no additional cost to you, but if you want to support us and click through our link, we do get a small commission. I've made one for you. It's over at lawbindingbiker.com forward slash torque dash wrenches. That's lawbindingbiker.com forward slash torque, T-O-R-Q-U-E, if you don't know how to spell torque, slash wrenches. T-O-R-Q. Yeah, T-O-R-Q. There you go. Uh, so lawbindingbiker.com forward slash torque wrenches. That will get you through to take a look at these bad boys. They're also in our regular Amazon store uh, that we've created. Um, but Lurch will put this in the show notes. You want to talk a little bit. It comes with a three eighths and a half inch. So like I say, it's a little set and I'm pretty amazed by them. Yeah. Even a retard like me can use them. Mm. We were talking about that earlier today. Apparently you can't say the word retard anymore. It's not politically correct, but correct. we are not politically correct here That's at this right. show. So even a guy like me can use them. I like the fact that they're digital. It's easy to dial it in right to the torque spec that you need. Mm -hmm. And then it's got the... The, the light's fine, but I, just, I like the buzzer. So I like the audible. It, yeah, you hit, you hit the audible, and then you know you're where you need to be. They're yep. easy to use. And very reasonable price. Uh, a lot of torque wrenches can get out of control, and I haven't used a lot of AC Delco stuff, but these have stand, stood the test of time, and they're our number one now go-to torque. We've got some others for backup, some of the older click ones and mm -hmm. stuff, but by far, um, foot pounds, inch pounds, whatever you need. Again, I'll put it in the show no, uh, they so. are a lot better than my Harbor Freight torque wrenches. Oh, God, dude, I can't believe you. That's one thing that, dude, I'll buy some stuff at uh, Harbor Freight. I can't believe that you went with the torque wrenches. They were oh, a gift. Okay, they were a gift. There you go. That's why. Also, that's the, what yeah. I was going to get to next that you bring that up is these are actual come with certi certificate of calibration, which I'm guessing your Harbor Freight ones did not. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> is what I'm but guessing. Most of my wrenching's done here, so I get to use all your tools and break them. Yeah, true. All right, guys. Uh, we got some special guests in the studio, so hang tight. They can't reveal themselves yet. Uh, I don't know if it'll be in the title or not, but uh, the, the, yeah, when it yeah, comes, his, when his it, name's in the no, title. No, not, not when it comes out in regular podcast format. That's up to you what you do. Well, that's what I, I was going to put it in Okay, there. all right. Yeah. So we'll get to our special guests. They're just standing by here, standing okay. by. All right, guys, don't forget also, we got the first aid and trauma kit for you in the Law Abiding Biker store. We've been selling the heck, the bejesus. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what the bejesus is, that's a lot. It's close to a metric defined, shit ton. Defined as a lot uh, by the Urban Dictionary. All right. As bikers, we all know that unexpected things can happen. Now, many of us are prepared for a mechanical issue, lurch, like we've had many in the past, with our beloved Cruise Tools Roadside Emergency Repair Kits, which you've said you've moved a lot during the holiday mm -hmm. season. Yeah, I had to order more. They're on their way. Noise. We have well, we still have them in stock, and we're getting more. That's the RTH three kits, guys, over at the Law Binding Biker Store. But here's the deal: oh. more serious than a motorcycle breakdown is an injury to you or someone you're riding with. Now, why would you risk not being prepared for that, bikeaholics? And that's why we brought it right to the uh, uh, brought the Law Binding Biker First Aid and Trauma Kit right to our store. I will note it's at a very affordable price. Uh, so we've given you no reason not to be prepared with a small and easily storable biker prepared first aid kit. Now, when we we were looking for a while at first aid kits for you guys, uh, we had been asked a lot. So in a nutshell, we got a bunch of different ones and some had stuff we didn't like. We looked at a lot of different ones that we could get and we wanted something that was 
affordable. We want to get in everybody's hands, but also size. And the biggest thing bikers are notorious for, uh, I think in a lot of sports or passions is we go overboard. No, we go, we, we think we need, uh, you know, what an ambulance carries. Uh, so we wanted to give you just the stuff that's actually something that you're probably going to use or save a life without being too big. Cause it does need to be on a motorcycle. Yeah. We tend to get out of hand. So it comes with everything you need with a plethora of different size bandages, gauze, compression, dressing, medical tape, latex gloves, whistle, scissors, rescue blanket. And most importantly, mm-hmm, one of our guests knows about this, a military tourniquet that can save a life. All right. And all these items are inside a very tightly packed tactical nylon molly bag measuring eight by four by four. Best of all is that, you know, it has our logo on it. It's our stamp of approval. It's not something you should have with you at all times, but a must have at all times. Get the law abiding biker first aid and trauma kit right in the law abiding biker store. And if you end up using it, please, if you're alive still send us a story about it. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) I always like to add the, if you're alive, because you know, I mean, I guess you can't leave one. If do you have one of these? You can t- absolutely. We we I'll got introduce one of these. later. Yeah. We just want to hear. Uh, so no, we 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 definitely carry one of these when we ride together. Um, along with the uh, cruise tool kit, we've got that as oh, well for our bikes. N- so, nice. So between us, we're we're set up. Um, but yeah, the the trauma kit. Hopefully that's not for you. You're going to have a hard time using it on yourself if, mm-hmm. if you're in this situation. But we have seen accidents happen in front of us and such, and you know. Even even fatal accidents happen on mm. rides we've been on. So having something like this is definitely useful. Yep. And I honestly freely admit I we were guilty for years, even being first responders or in your case, military. And it's like, why didn't I not carry a medic? We've carried all tools. Because like, we carry it in our cars and we are always prepared, but we were admittedly. So uh, we're prepared now. We Hopefully are. all the bikers out there will now have an option to be prepared. There you go. Want to ride longer? Tired of a sore, sore and achy ass lurch? Uh, yeah. Then stop drinking late at night and hanging out in dark alleys? I can't help myself. You won't have that. Fix it with a high quality butt buffer seat cushion. Head over to lawbindingbiker.com forward slash store. Check out our full line of butt buffer seat cushions. Oh yeah, once you've used Rick Rack, you'll never go back. The ultimate motorcycle luggage rack solution. Forget those messy straps and bungee cords. Go strapless. Or the Rick Rock Quick Attach Luggage System and Quality Bag. Head over to lawbuddingbiker.com for a set store. Get hooked up now. Moving a lot of zero stuff during the holidays to Bikeaholics because they have a wide variety of innovative products for your Harley Davidson and a brand new line for the all new Honda Goldwing named Gold Strike. I like gold. The top quality, affordable chrome lighting and comfort products. Zero Gold Strike are the motorcycle LED lighting innovators for CAN bus plug and play system compatibility. Head over to lawbindingbiker.com for a store and check out our full line of Zero 3D products. Suppose we should do a podcast here. We got special guests. I'm excited in studio, not remotely, right here, physically here. Welcome back, you freaking bikeholics. This is the podcast for the motorcycle majority of the big and I'm also known as the 99%. Large and in charge of the motorcycle scene more than any time in history by being here, by listening. You're part of what we call the hashtag biker revolution. Mm. Now, before we get started. We do have just one question for you. What are you waiting for, Bikeholics? Mount up and let us take you on another wild-ass ride. There you go. Ryan Urlacher here, your host of the Law Abiding Biker Podcast and your high-tech redneck. Got a zinger of an episode for you guys. Zinger? That's a a new one for you. Zinger. And the definition of zinger is good. It's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. We've got, it's just a, a chilling episode. Uh, like I say, a couple people on the mics, which we're going to introduce here in the second biker talk with a patron member. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, did you look it up, Lurch? Yeah, it is a quick, witty, or pointed remark or retort. Mm, there you go. Zinger. Remember that one. Now, we like to, uh, we do a, put out a ton of videos. We like to announce a video on the podcast, um, at least one of so many that we put out. And this one, uh, let's see. So this is our new documentary film, which I dropped early December, if I remember mm-hmm. right. And yeah. it is The Road to Brotherhood, a motorcycle adventure. We will put uh, a link to it in the uh, show notes. However, Remember, guys, anytime you want to get to this documentary or any of my documentaries, it's lawbindingbiker.com forward slash ride dash now. 
We always sell one. So this one, the Road to Brotherhood, will be for purchase at a very reasonable price uh, for the next year. And uh, once it, uh, uh, my new one comes out, then this one will eventually be free. Don't forget top tier patron members. This is in the back end of your patron account. So it's already viewable. Just log into your patron accounts. And if it recognizes whether you're top tier or above, uh, and you can watch it right there. Um, and again, uh, go to that link. You can purchase it. And uh, with that said, since we're talking about this, it's not in the show notes. Two days before Christmas, um, I released our uh, West Coast documentary oh, finding right. that elusive place which was for sale for the past year now this one is the other one like i said the cycle it released free on youtube so getting lots of comments and feedback on that again finding that elusive place over at the law abiding biker youtube channel so i just wanted to release that during the holiday seasons and before new year a lot of people are home and uh people have time to grab a beverage of their choice and kick back and ride along with us. That was a uh, fun one. So yeah, trailer is out on YouTube for the road to brotherhood. If you want to see that, uh, there you go, guys. So uh, we love our sponsors up front. Do we have any to no. announce Lurch? No, we don't. Okay. Mm. All right, guys. So speaking we got of one here with us, we do. We have a patron member right here in the studio with us and his wife uh, so, Anthony Peters, Stacy Peters, welcome to the Law Abiding Biker Podcast. Hey, thanks. Great to be here. Can't believe I, you know, flew all the way out to Washington, you know, and made the trip all the way over here. This is this is like super exciting. Um, sorry if I sound funny. I'm still getting over a little bit of a sinus issue, so oh, you know, that do the here. best I can for. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's how he normally sounds. So, uh -huh, yeah, there you I, go. I do normally sound a bit nasally and deep one throated. for Stacy. We're keeping count. We're oh, sure. We're going to keep yeah, a tally. Keep, keep tally on that. She'll, she'll have them racked up by the end oh, of the that's, show. That's a zinger, by the way. That is a zinger. There you go. That's the proper use of the word zinger. Stacy, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. And finally, you actually see what this looks like in real, in real life. It's yeah. a lot smaller than people imagine, isn't it? I mean, that's normal. <laughs> oh, another one. That's Dude, so you're already two behind. Two zingers. <laughs> <laughs> two behind. All right. I like how this is going. Uh, so... Yeah, so welcome to the studio. I do want to talk about your impressions of it because I we have a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. And we're on a time uh, crunch, guys, because we're going to, but we've still got plenty of time. Oh, yeah. We are going to do a live after this. It's a public live, uh, so, but we're recording this one first. So interestingly, guys, this is, you know, there's a lot of benefits um, for becoming a patron member. And we've talked about it in the past. I know I talk about a lot. I'm sure people are like, stop talking about the patron members, but I will always do that. And I will never stop uh, because they are the foundation of law binding biker media. And unlike a lot of other platforms, which I just don't see, maybe I'm just not seeing it. Um, we have had a handful uh, of patron members over the years. Uh, uh, Anthony, Stacey are from the East coast. I'll let them talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but they happen to be over here for the holidays and they have family over here. And uh, we, we've we known Anthony for a lot of years now online, and I've met him in person at Patron Meetup. And uh, they happen to be here, and I love getting patron members in the studio, whether that's remotely, but I even prefer it more right here in the studio. So we actually put patron members on the mics, guys. That's how much they mean to me, and I'm not doing that. I just, I literally want to hear from them, and I love finding out about people, and that's the best part about the biker community, in my opinion, and kind of what Law Abiding Biker Media has evolved to is just bikers connecting with bikers like this and being able to chat and share a passion that we all love. So um, okay. here we are again with the patron member on the mic. It's great to be here. I mean, yeah, I mean we're, we're probably going to be getting into it here, but I mean, this podcast has meant so much for so long to me. I mean, I found you guys, you know, the way so many people did with that original oil change video mm. that you did. Um, I think, gosh, that was maybe around 2015. I discovered you guys. So just, just a couple of years after you started and everything, and you may, you saved me so much money and so much hassle helping me with oil changes. And then over the years, your videos have helped me so much that it just would not feel right to not contribute and be a patron. Um, 
for all the money you've saved me, but it's not just the money I save. And what I also try to teach people now is by being able to wrench on your own ride, it enhances your riding even more because now you have that relationship with your machine. You know, I have guys that bring their bikes to me and I do the oil change and stuff like that for them. But I am all too happy when they ask me like, hey, can you teach me to do this myself? Absolutely, because I want you to have that enjoyment the same way. And that's something that you guys helped me get with your videos. So I'm, I'm always referring people to your videos and stuff. And I even tell other content creators and such out there that like, hey, you want to make a video, especially a how-to video, they need to watch yours and see how professional and how well done yours is. I mean, I've looked up so many videos before and it's a <laughs> knucklehead trying to hold a phone and yeah. it's like, I have no idea what you're pointing at. Can you, can you get somebody, you know, get your girlfriend or whoever out there to hold the phone for you at least so I can <laughs> see what you're doing. So, or the guy that, you know, starts the job halfway through and it says, okay, so we're going to do this. And I've already done steps A, B and C. It's like, bro, my, my machine's yeah. already, you know, it's put together. I need to see how to, how to go from put together to what you have. So, right. Yeah. So, it, you know, like I said, what you guys have given me, the reason I'm a patron and I continue to be a patron is because I want to give back. And like, like you mentioned, you don't know if other platforms, um, you know, create a community the same way and they don't. The ones that I've found, and there's other, there's other, you know, YouTubers out there that I subscribe to their channel, but I'm not a you know a patron for them, even though they have it, because it's like, what are they giving me other than a little bit of entertainment? You guys are actually helping the community. So that's why I contribute. And that's why, you know, I've also, you know, hit you up on emails before, like, hey, have you thought about this? You know, help you because coming up with content is I don't know how you do it, right? I mean, constantly coming up with content, that is a struggle. I mean, I've done other stuff. Um for instance, like when I was in Iraq, I, I did like a little shtick every morning and coming up with material every morning was a challenge. Yeah, I bet. You know, and I only needed like two minutes, but it's still a challenge. And for you to come up with a couple podcasts a month or a couple videos a month, that's a real struggle. And, and you know, those of us out there in the community, we appreciate it and we respect it and anything I can do to keep help you know, keep this thing rolling on down the road. Yeah, buddy. I'm going to do it. Yeah, I appreciate that. All those comments very much. Interestingly, one point uh, on that is, you know, it is a lot of why I started is just the the lack of it. YouTube, unfortunately, over the last 11 years has become an abyss of garbage content. And it's so hard to sift through now. When we started, it was a little bit easier. Um, but there was just a lot of junk and um and there still is, uh, especially like we, me and Oscar were talking the other day, you know, he does some dirt bike stuff and trying to find any, he goes, you should make some, I go, dude, I'm already so busy and you, know, you should make some dirt because they're, they're doing exactly what you said. Uh, as far as the maintenance goes, it's an interesting time that you bring that up uh, right now because, uh, you know, however you want to look at it, the economy just isn't what it is, what, what it was a couple of years ago and without getting political, whatever you think that way, I, I just objectively, the economy has tanked a bit. And I can tell you that we get a lot of emails and I can tell you right now, cause I was at our, I take, uh, we have to have some work done on our police bikes just because of the contract at the dealership. And I don't know what it is over there, but across the line now you're talking for a simple oil change service, you're talking 450 to $550 on a Harley Davidson motorcycle. That's insane. So I'm just telling you guys out there, and if you got money to burn, that's cool. I wish I was you. And you just don't care. Uh, there's just right now is there's, you know, no better time to learn, uh, like Anthony said, to do an oil cha change yourself. That What they're doing is not a $550 value and there's nothing to it once you see our video. Anyways, with that said, all our premium maintenance videos for the uh, twin cams, for the Mil Milwaukee 8 soft tails, uh, doesn't matter what it is, Dinas, we've got you covered. It's all over at lawabidingbiker.com forward slash buy videos. No dash, 
Hmm? Indian. Don't forget Indian. We got some Indian. We do yeah. on yeah. the uh, on yeah on the uh, so the one eleven uh, thunder yeah. yeah thunderstruck. We don't have it on the new uh, motors yet, but uh, um, maybe we should do one. See what I mean? There Stacey's you go. Stacy's got the thunderstruck. I have so. the one sixteen. Yeah. Okay. So she's got the you know the big engine, but. My, one. One, my, my liquid cooled 108 will still outdo it. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a scream. Keep dreaming, baby. <laughs> <laughs> what, what Ryan said. Well, he gets one for that. Or she you makes one, my one dreams one. come true, though. So, yeah. <laughs> what, what Ryan said and what I was thinking, because I didn't know if uh, I should say it, was we got that uh, pursuit sitting out there, and we, we've had it long enough that we may need to do an oil change. It's on. been overdue. It yeah. keeps, yeah. seriously, uh, almost. Might have to do a video on a, that. A month after I got it, it's been telling me oil change, but they leave it with me and. Um, and we don't know when it's going back, so. No, well, we I mean, we return to, something better than you got we it. We might so, have to do I mean, service on it. Your oil change will definitely be better. Than yeah, right. It's true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, guys, yeah, I, I uh, with that said, there's no better time. Save money with the economy. Groceries are more expensive. Gas is more expensive. We can get you through the oil change. You're going to, like Anthony said it too, you're going to feel so much better taking a vested interest in your own bike. And knowing it's done right, we're, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. But every time we take something in the past to a dealership, something ends up wrong or not tighten. And it's just, uh, um, you think about that, how much money you're going to save at 550, depending on how much you ride. Isn't that insane? It's like, ridiculous. I can't even understand that. I can't even fathom no. what they're doing. Cause with literally an oil change, if you just do a filter, your, your three holes on a Harley specifically, you know, and then we show you how to do the inspection, inspects the brakes and stuff like that. We'll show you how to, you know, axles and belt deflection and all that. Um, if I'm doing it slow, a little over an hour. So a couple beers, an hour of your time, you just saved yourself 500. The parts are going to cost you about a hundred. On average, yeah. 70 to a hundred, mm-hmm. depending on what kind of oil you're using. Um, we do use Amsoil. You guys can get that in our, in the law abiding biker store. We are a dealer. But uh, yeah, so that's a that's a substantial savings right now. No, even even with the Amsoil, I mean, I switched over because of you know the, the different podcast that Oscar mm-hmm. did, and that's one thing I I so I've become a dealer myself. But with my friends, are you a dealer too? Very yeah, cool. Yeah, Very I cool. became a, you know I started saving enough, and then I was a uh, preferred customer, and I had enough friends that were like, hey, I want to try it too. And I was doing enough oil changes between my vehicles, our motorcycles, and then friends that I was like, okay, I'll become a dealer. Um, so yeah, I have friends that come over to my house. You know, my shop's not as nice as yours. <laughs> we have to keep it somewhat organized yeah, for the yeah. videos. <laughs> I don't, I don't have the lift, but you know, my friends come over. I've got the beer fridge, so they get to drink a beer while I'm, you know, changing their fluids for them. You don't um, get that at the dealership. No, or, or, or <laughs> what dealerships whiskey give it? Too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, whiskey, you cigars, know, whiskey. cigar. Yeah, you yeah, know. buddy. We're so, a one-stop shop. Yeah, you know, we 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 take care of our customers a little better, you know, and then. Yeah. I know like our local dealers, you know, between the Indian and the Harley shops and stuff, they were up to like recently up to a two month wait, you know, it didn't matter what you needed done. You were looking at a two month wait to get your ride in and get something done. Wow. So you can call me up and depending on what you need done, I've probably got the fluids and the filters on hand. So, you know, and so my... As a preferred customer doing it yourself, you can do all three holes with the filter for under 150 bucks. Yep, totally. You know, compared to what were you saying the dealer it's like is? like 450 to 550, depending on where you are yeah. in the U.S. It's, it's, ri- it's ridiculous. I'm, oh. re- I'm reeling it back with the three hole comment. <laughs> oh, I got you, got you. I saw her smile and I'm like, I think I like her even more. <laughs> I do. This is great. This is fit right in. <laughs> Very good. She's, she's going to one up us. Uh, so being an Indian owner, uh, have you looked at the, what the dealership's charging for an Indian oil change in service? Is it as outrageous or... Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, so and it's a one last, hole change with the Indian. It's, it's one hole. Yep. But what the anything, last- anything on the one hole, <laughs> okay, we're just making sure. I mean, one I like, hole's I like just the boring. three holes yeah. better, but yeah, you know. yeah. more, more holes, the merrier. So, exactly. <laughs> right. One hole makes it easier. Yeah. True. True that. <laughs> true. But, um, it's true. I think the I like last one we paid for was just the simple, like 500 mile break in. And that was my challenger, which was our second Indian. Um, her chieftain's our third. And I didn't even, I didn't even take it to the dealership for the 500 on hers, 
because it's like I'm paying three hundred and fifty dollars for you to just do a basic oil change. Right. I can do it for half that much. Why why am I gonna why am I gonna pay for that? You know, and and like we've you know, you've talked about on the the podcast here. What are they really doing? Are they doing a you know <laughs> two hundred and fifty? Two hundred and fifty. Right. Uh-huh. You know, you've, you guys have talked about it. They are not pulling out the torque wrench and double checking every torque spec on the Derby cover and every place else on the bike. It's not cost effective it's a joke. Yeah. or, you know, efficient for them to do that. So being a realist, it's like, no, nope, I'll do, you know, and what you guys taught me about the Magnus Moss Act, mm-hmm. they can't make me do it. So I can do just as good a job for less at home. Yep. Yeah, so, well said. And that's that's what I tell people when they ask me about, you know, the products I use and what I do, you know, is, you know, the Magnus Moss Act, that right there says that, you know, if your dealership's telling you some of this, you know, untrue stuff, we'll right. say, you know, um, then, yeah, don't don't trust that dealership then. Yep. Because who knows what other, you know, falsehoods they're telling you. So, yep. but yeah. Very true. Uh, yeah, the inspection 200 whatever point 250 uh, points that's a joke and i can just tell you from taking our work bikes in there uh because we like i say we have to just lots of long story policies and stuff but uh i just recently we took a bike in and it had a literal oil leak and they sent it back with and they didn't find it and i found we found it ourselves and fixed it ours we brought it out here they do let me do some work on them depending on what it is and we fixed it was an oil cooler hose and it's like how did you not like there's gummed up oil. they're not inspecting it it was did like they, three whole really oil chains that's all they it? did no. yep. yep. didn't do yep. crap and they probably gave it to the least experienced guy in the shop they you know. do some aren't even certified right so you know they can do oil changes they'll allow them to do that but you're right yep. yeah yeah i had a buddy bring me his uh ultra classic and i got under there to uh, you know pull the drain plug mm-hmm. and i was i was almost able to do it with my fingers we've had that and i was like Yep. You know, hey, where'd you get this done last? Oh, it was done at the dealership. Don't ever take it back there again. Yep. Yeah, people just, you know, that's the way dealerships are. They're just in such a hurry to, the, everything is time and they're allotted by the book a certain, so yeah, it's just, uh, anyways, we've harped on that enough, but I appreciate you bringing that up. But they're always good conversations and I thought it was a good time, especially with the economy, the way it is and saving some coin, do not throw your money away. All right. You can, you don't need a lift. A lift makes it nice, but I did them for years without a lift. So it can be done. On that mm-hmm. note, as yeah. far as making it easier and, you know, doing it yourself, one thing that somebody pointed out to me, just go get the disposable turkey pan at the grocery store. Yeah. yeah you know, that's that. a great, you know, great oil catch that'll fit on, if you just want to try it once and you don't want to get invested. Like I've got the fancy Harley yeah, you know, me too. catch, but if you just want to give it a try, Yeah. Just go spend like two dollars at the grocery store and get the nice shallow turkey pan. Yep, and that'll yeah. catch your five quarts for you. Our dollar store has them down here. You could buy them in bulk. Yeah, there you buck, go. Yep, buck a piece. Didn't you get a bunch there? I did. Not for that purpose, but I yeah, got for barbecue. That's where I remember. Yeah, They're a little thin though. Yeah, are they? Well, <laughs> yeah. they were a buck. <laughs> they were a buck. 25. I think they'd be good for oil. Hey, <laughs> but when you buy them three at a time, you can you know stick right. yeah, them together. Yeah. Double them up. Yeah, yeah. A buck a piece, no biggie. Yeah. All right. So let's dive in a little bit. Um, uh, with uh, basically Anthony, tell us a, we're going to learn a little bit about you, uh, patron member, a long time, and a little bit about your background, which I know some, but I don't know a lot. And so I was like getting to know you. So tell us about growing up and kind of your writing background and why to this day you have a passion. Yeah. So, I mean, much like you guys always share with your stories, you know, started off young kid writing BMX and everything, you know early eighties and stuff. Yeah, bro. And I remember, I mean, I remember my dad teaching me how to ride on a hill when we were stationed in Hawaii. So my dad was a Marine for 27 years. Um, nice. And yeah, he taught me how to, te- how to ride a bike when we were in Hawaii. I was like kindergarten or pre-K actually. And then from there, I just always loved being on my bicycle And I remember early 80s, we were stationed in uh, Southern California, living in Chula Vista. So anyone that like... Chula Vista? Yeah, anyone that pays attention, there's a lot of like off-road racing and motorcycles and trucks and stuff still in Chula Vista. Yeah. But back when we lived there, I mean, it's houses now, but it was just open canyons that people had like motocross and BMX tracks built in. And we would just ride out there 
And I mean, I, I can't imagine letting a kid do that these days, but like, yeah, <laughs> first through third grade, I'm out there in these canyons by myself sometimes just hitting these jumps, hitting the whoops and everything. And just always loved riding. And you know, that, that transitioned into, you know, like mountain bike and hang on. What kind of BMX bike did you have, bro? So the f- I remember my best one, PK Ripper. PK oh, Ripper. Dude. See, you, PK your your Ripper family, I thought yeah. your family was poor, man. We were. Yeah. So here's the deal. I had old, you know, off-brand bikes and BMX bikes because that's all we could afford. And I'd piece them together from cousins and shit. Uh-huh. Well, one of my cousins was well-to-do. Well, he was getting out of BMX bike oh, and so he was basically doing, I, I did, but he only made me pay like 50 bucks for it. And so that's how I ended up. Eventually, I worked my way up, though. I didn't have nice bikes, that's for sure. So I definitely did not have a nice bike, okay? You talk about piece together. I remember my dad buying something at the swap meet Yeah, and, you know, spray painting it for me and everything. Definitely sounds like your dad. Yep. (laughs) Dude, my dad did that. Old, you know, old, you know, came from the, you know, working family German background. So it's like, yeah, you got to make something work, you know? So, yep. He made, he built me my first BMX bike. So that's what I had for years. And, uh, I think the first like new BMX bike I ever got, I was in like the sixth grade and, you know, now we're talking 1986 ish, you know, Miami vice was the thing and everything. Yeah. I had this, you know, hot pink bike with the disc wheels so you know it was faster everything you thought it was faster yeah, anyway. right, right. but that's what i had later and that ended up getting stolen so you know <clears throat> excuse me the hot pink bike yep so had that then you know again being military we were moving around so chula vista oceanside california then rhode island rhode island you know, bicycle was a little more difficult because, you know, a lot more snow and everything. But there I had the paper route, so still riding. And then from there we moved to Virginia where I ended up going to high school and everything. But um, during this time, yeah, during you probably this, wanted a motorcycle, right? Oh, my gosh. Dude, it's still my childhood yeah. dream. We could not afford one. I remember God, I remember drove uh, me nuts. one of my babysitters when we lived in Chula Vista their family had dirt bikes and everything. And just like seeing the dirt bikes, like, oh man, I really want to go out and ride on those. Jealous. The best I could do, you know, okay. So I get to put the baseball card in the tires or something. You You did that too. (laughs) Yep. Did it. Or uh, like my first actual experience on a bike. So that same time frame in Chula Vista to save money, my dad had like a Kawasaki 350 and he would use that just to ride to work and everything. And that lasted until one foggy morning, mm. some knucklehead didn't even see him and just like plowed into him. Um, he was he was unhurt. I mean, he stayed on the bike, even though it was on the hood of the car. But mom at that point was like, mm, no, you're not you're not doing this anymore. But he had he had ridden even in like high school and stuff on like his buddy's Honda Dream and such. So that was his experience. But he stopped riding after that. But never, never did that desire to ride motorcycles leave me. And I remember, um, again, around, you know, the fifth, sixth grade time frame, visiting my relatives on the farm and they had a four wheeler. So, Hey, four wheeler, that's still pretty yeah. darn cool. There. Anything. And, yeah. yeah. So me and my cousin, we'd have to do like our farm chores every morning and everything before we could ride on the four wheeler. And we just, you know, burned through a tank of gas easy on that thing. So, but uh, yeah, so that was that was in my youth. That was my only real motorcycle experience. And then, well, I guess it was still my youth. But getting older, maybe junior senior year of high school, mm-hmm. another buddy had like you know just a little ninety cc Honda, and we'd take that out to the little uh, you know the power line break where people would you know rip around and everything. And so riding that little dirt bike around, so that was that was fun. But yeah, it wasn't until I was about 20 that I finally like got something of my own and got stupid with it, I'll say. Yeah, (laughs) at 20. Yeah, yeah, you know, I was was active duty and I had a little extra money and saw this trail bike for sale. It was like a 500cc Honda trail bike, you know, a little enduro thing. And I was like, yeah. 
I could take that on the trails here at base and everything. You know, back then you were allowed to like just rip around on base and such. And they even had, uh, so at Camp Lejeune back then, they actually had a spot on base where it was like a motocross track. So, and then they also just had regular trails you were allowed to ride on. Yeah. Well, it was badass. The only problem (laughs) is I had no idea what I was doing on two wheels. I, I had not learned yet that riding a bicycle does not translate into riding a motorcycle. You know, the physics involved there, right. knowing how to use the controls to control the bike. You know, I thought, oh, you just lean, you turn, right? No, so very different as I learned when I took the MSF course, mm-hmm, finally. Mm-hmm. But I ended up hitting an engineering bridge. So this is one of those ones, you know, like a bridging company will use so that we can get across a gap in battle. And they had one set up in the training areas. And when I had a four-wheeler before, I would hit that thing and just sail across it. Well, I got this motorcycle now, and I hit that thing at about 40 miles an hour and came down on the back wheel. And I came off the bike. It starts going, you know, like a pinball from side to side. (laughs) I'm trying to avoid getting hit by this thing. Meanwhile, the grading of this bridge is just removing the butt from my jeans. So, yeah, I came up looking, uh, you know, like I came out of the – what is it in Police Academy, the Blue Oyster Club or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah the, the the butt from my jeans was gone. and Need a butt buffer. I, oh, oh, shit. I don't know that a butt buffer would have saved that That's one. That's a tired and sorry. I, I definitely needed a butt buffer after that. So, And then what, what added insult to injury on that, at the time, I was going through the instructor's course to be a swim instructor in the Marine Corps, which is actually really tough. Um, like 75% of people will fail. You know, they just can't physically make it or something. And I was in the middle of that course and you have to do things like I'm jumping off a 20 foot tower and I've just got road rash on my rear end. <laughs> so that, that made the rest of that course real difficult. And, you know, everyone was sympathetic, you know, where they saw me in the locker room and, you know, it was like, wow. Ooh, you know, you, yeah. Just getting smacked on the butt every time you enter the water like that. So yeah, that, that, uh, that taught me a good lesson there. So I definitely did not get on a bike again until after taking the motorcycle safety foundation okay. course. Which in the military, it's free because you're required to have that to be allowed to ride on base. You got to wear high vis on base too, don't you? Not anymore. I see all, oh, really? Not I see anymore. Guys always going out here to the training center in yeah, high like vis. Sash, high vis. Yeah. Sash, yeah. So, Not anymore, really. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they got rid of that. Um, in fact, when I was stationed here, so 2010 to through 2012, um, having to wear your your glow belt Mm -hmm. went away, but I got around it because it wasn't really a requirement of you have to wear a reflective vest or your reflective belt. You had to have reflective material on. So I bought the Harley Davidson jacket that had the reflective bar and shield on the back. So I was good without looking like a dork. Right, right. So, but- um, What were you wearing when you went down on that bridge? Do you have a helmet on? I had that a was helmet required, on. Probably. Yes. I had a helmet on. Full face? No, it was just a three quarter. But novelty helmet, or actual DOT? No, it was, it was a okay. real. It was a real helmet. Um, <laughs> novelty helmet. That's <laughs> that's the next accident I'm going to tell you. About. Oh, nice. So yeah. <laughs> okay. So Stacy Stacy enjoys that accident. I love it so much. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah. So so I was I was smart enough. So that was you know that was ninety six ninety seven time frame. Can I ask um, you, did you make it through your swimming instructor thing even injured? I did. Not a boy. I did. Big I suffered deep. through that and I made it through that. And you know, it was it was a struggle, but yeah, made it through that. So All right, let's do this real quick. Speaking of sore and achy asses, you want to ride longer? <laughs> did Lou just treat your up? ass with some respect already? Get hooked up with a premium butt buffer seat cushion. This company of bikers developed super thin hospital grade seat cushion made of solid and elastic materials, and it's unlike gel pads that will leak if punctured. The butt buffer is designed not to slide around in your seat. Fits all motorcycles and stalls in seconds. Easy to clean and, yep, helps to dampen those gall darn vibrations. With plenty of models to choose from, they assure you'll have a comfortable ass when riding. Head over to the Law Bunny Biker Store and check out our full line of butt buffer seat cushions. So the he got up and barked. It was kind of in tune with the music. And Dude, everything. it's so funny. So uh, there's this one guy 
and I was watching it was a Instagram reel, just the abyss of wasting mindless time. And uh, I like the funny ones, but you know how dogs like him, little dogs jump up. You're everybody's on the couch, relaxing, sleeping. You don't know what they're barking at. Just out of the blue, get you. Woo, woo, woo. Well, he's got like three little ones, dude. And so he wanted to see what it was like to do it back to them. So it's just a funny video, dude. So they're all sitting on the couch and just all of a sudden he gets up and they're all, they all freak out, dude. And they're doing spins like, what, what, what? And they're all like, it's just, you know, like we do, like, what the fuck are you barking at? You know, and they're all like, yeah, just go back to sleep, dude. It's like, yeah, funny <laughs> shit, dude. I'm going to do that to him, dude. I don't know what he's barking at. Lulu. I do that to our dog, but she's deaf. So <laughs> she gets yeah. so, you, not you the desired effect. No, you, you, you want to do that to her. You just walk up and pet her when she's sleeping. Uh huh. Uh huh. Completely deaf, huh? Uh, pretty much. I pretty mean, much. I think she hears certain. Is she ranges. just old? She's, yeah. yeah, she's old, but I think okay. she just hears certain ranges and stuff. Yep. That's how our old dog yeah. before he passed was a uh, little cockadoo, cockapoo, cockadoodle doo, Cock-a, yeah, yeah. cockadoodle doo, cockapoo. He was deaf and blind, and he heard, like you say, some ranges. You could clap your hands real loud, and then he would get a response. But other than that, low range, you couldn't. She has so, real good yeah. hearing when it comes to food, though. Oh, oh yeah, course, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, the nose still works really well. Let's oh see. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she definitely has that going. All right, so let's uh, let's dive in. So that's your a little bit of your background growing up. It's interesting. A lot of guys were you know that we've had on the podcast are kind of like you and I were maybe not well to do when we're growing up and dream of having a motorcycle. And you're like, someday we're going to have a motorcycle, which is m- maybe why we're so Determined. passionate about it now because it's something what was unobtainable back yeah. then. Um, interesting. We were talking. We did a dirt bike uh, adventure podcast here, two series with Big Daddy and Oscar last week, and it was one of the conversations that came up is the the biggest demographic of dirt bike owners, you would think it would be young kids. It's not. It's guys our age. And we came to the realization that's because when you get our age, you finally have enough money and hopefully you've established yourself. You can actually afford to do that sport. I wished it were the other way around. You could get one when you were We've younger. We've got the means for that luxury item. Exactly. At, finally. Exactly. Maybe it's better that way because like you say, when you're young and you have that much power between your legs, uh, you tend to get in trouble with it. And you're So I don't know. It, it might be better for us. Uh, we just don't like it as males. We'd like that stuff in our 20s, right? When you're younger and you heal more and you don't get as sore as quick. But uh, that is, that's the biggest demographic of kind of that market right now is, and maybe probably our market too for street, you know? So probably why. I do see a lot, like when you start looking at the, uh, like the BMW 1200, like Big Daddy used to have and everything. Mm-hmm. It is it is older guys on those. It's not the younger guys riding those. So yep. yeah, I, I get it. I get it. You know, yep. and I, I, when I finally got into riding, I was on the fence, you know, did I want a BMW like that or did I want to triumph Bonneville or did mm-hmm. I want to go Harley Davidson? I was on the fence with them. Yeah. Were you looking at that time to get into touring or were you like me where you just wanted to get a Harley and you didn't really, you weren't in the touring game yet. You're like, I just need a Harley. I want a bike. And then you figure out, okay, that's not going to work for long distance. I just wanted two wheels. Yeah. So, um, for years and years, I mean, as I, as I got older, and, you know, took the motorcycles, even before I managed to get into the motorcycle safety course, it's like, you know, even if I just got, you know, a Honda Shadow 650 or something, just to ride to work every day, that would just be a nice, you know, that's your Zen moment or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was, I was actually, I had switched from the Marine Corps where I started my career I had switched over to the army and I was going through explosive ordnance disposal school. So bomb squad school and I'd failed a test. So I was out of training waiting to get back into training again. And I was like, Hey, can I go over to the next base over and take the motorcycle course since I'm just sitting around anyway? And they're like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. You know, that was three days. They didn't have to figure out what to do with me. Busy work. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So they let me do that. You know, it it was, Two and a half days, you know, even one day it rained on us, but hey, you got to get the class in. So, you know, got that, got that wet weather riding yeah. experience. So it really paid off when I, uh, when I ended up in Washington and finally got my first bike and I ended up with a sports. When ra- was that? Give me a time frame. 
because you were stationed here, I have in my notes uh, yep. that I wrote 2010 to 2012. What I mean by here, guys, is uh, just outside of Sela, Washington, Yakima, Washington is a training center. And so you were stationed right here for a couple uh, of years. Not, not here in Yakima. Oh, oh you was, were stationed at- I was over at that's Fort right, Lewis. That's right. Or now it's Joint Base Lewis McCord. Um, that's right. Yep. And- Honestly, my unit came over here to train. Okay. Every time they came over here to train, that's when I was being a super knucklehead and going out and trying for special forces. So mm. I always I always dodged the bullet of coming over here to Yakima and instead went to North Carolina and Is know, this not a desirable? No, nah, I, 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 I just I, I don't know. I don't I'm, think I'm a glutton is. for punishment, you know. I, in in the military, you know, I I was that old guy that just kept acting like a young guy. Yeah. I mean, even all the way up until my retirement, I was still the old guy acting like the young guy. He still does that. I yep. still do too. Yep. Isn't I mean, that kind of the people we hang out with? Kind of seems <laughs> like kind of seems like heart, I'm not growing up. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll never grow up. I had to. I had to get a you know much younger wife just to you know someone can keep up with me. Right. Even, right. So. Yeah, you're talking about eighty six. I'm like that was a good year. I was negative two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Let's yep, go, babe. Yep. Let's go. She I'm, can, I'm punching up when it comes to the wife category. So, yeah. <laughs> so, we, uh, so the year that you were stationed there, give me that time frame again. So I got here in that was mid 2010. So okay. it was summertime 2010. Um, I was here with Fourth Brigade, Second Infantry Division, and yeah, I. Honestly, my life was going down the toilet at that point. Yeah, you know, I, I got here and my first marriage just fell apart. Um, and the only thing I had going for me was I got a second job working at the Cabela's in Lacey. Oh, yeah? And yeah, so, you know, I'd already been a combat instructor in the Marine Corps. I knew so much stuff about so many different weapon systems and everything that I easily got hired at the gun counter there. And that's where I actually met this hottie right here, okay. you know, just hanging out in the break room one day and she walks in and it's like, yep, I'm going to get to know her. So, you know. Nice. And it, here it, we are it, 11 it, years yeah, later. It, it took a while. You know, I had to be smooth, you know, couldn't rush things and everything. Well, I was also so, dating somebody. Exactly. So, so I had to be patient. But Was it, it the beard? There was he no beard back then. Oh. Yeah. He's, he's got the butt chin. He's got the superhero <laughs> butt chin. If he, if he shaves that down. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, he's beard. got that real strong chin. <laughs> that beard came after retirement, if I remember it right. It did. Yeah. It did. So, mm-hmm. like, if you go back to the Sturgis video, yeah. I think I've got, like, four days of not shaved there, but I had to go play oh. Army for another two right. weeks after yeah. that. So. Yeah, you were in the process of retiring. Yeah. 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 Definitely enjoy the beard now. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> She doesn't care how long I have it as long as I have it. Wife yeah. approved. Right. Yep. Very cool. So, but yeah, so that was, that was mid 2010 until late 12. So like I mentioned, I was going off and trying to join, you know, special guys and everything and I succeeded. So that's what took me away from here. And so I went to, you know, Fort Bragg at the time. Now it's Fort Liberty. And I played with them for about a year before somebody decided mm, they didn't want me. So, okay, cool. Go back to the old job. And that's when we ended up in uh, Colorado. So, yep. Had the, so I had the Sportster from here, had the Sportster in North Carolina for a year. Like Sportster 1200? No, 883L, but I had, I had like the nice 16 inch apes on that thing and everything. So you did the 16s. I had those for a while. I remember, I remember, and you'll appreciate this, you know, living, living here in Washington. I remember, so you have a motorcycle mentor in your unit in the military or in the army. They call it something different in each branch, but my motorcycle mentor, I worked directly with him. And he was this old crusty dude whose dad told him like, yeah, you can ride the panhead if you can start it. Mm. And he said he couldn't even touch the ground. He had to learn how to like hop off the motorcycle, but it would take all his weight to kickstart that thing. And then he would ride it around the yard. So this guy, he had been riding forever since like he was seven. And uh, he's like, all right, let's go for a ride. And he took me from Tacoma all the way around Rainier and back. Nice. And I'm Free on pass an, ride, probably. Oh my God. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. I'm on an 883 with a bare bones LaPera seat. Oh. I, you had, I was, had a bare yeah, bones LaPera too, bro. 
What a was, shitty seat, yeah. but it looked badass. <laughs> oh, it looked great. Oh, I looked like a but badass. But you know what? <laughs> After an hour and a half, <laughs> no, your you butt did. was done, and I did not have a butt buffer. So that yeah, is hilarious. I was, I was really hurt, and I think that took us about four hours to go all the way around. On Not that bike with the bare bones and 16 apes, that's, oh. a, that's, a, that's like riding 10 days on a touring bike. Well, pretty much. <laughs> so when I got it from the dealership, they had taken, because they knew uh, this was like me really getting into riding again. They had taken the apes off and put it down to drag bars. Okay. I, it was when I got to North Carolina, I put it back to the apes. So yeah, I, I'm... But still, it's not the bars. It was yeah. the seat on that journey. Mid control I mean, seats. I yeah, remember. I remember finishing that ride, and it was it was like uh, Cowboy talks about how he used to ride that tank and have yep. to like lay down on the gas tank and put your feet back, and yeah, that's how I finished that ride because it's just my rear end was so sore from riding and sitting on that seat. But it was it was a learning experience. Yep. You got to go through those. And that's what makes you the seasoned, experienced rider, and you know what you need. You know yep. what works for you. Yep. So, and what kind of riding? That's how you learn. Like, okay, you know, we started out shorter distance, and then we learned, okay, okay, this is interesting. We, I definitely want to travel, but this bike isn't going to work, and you know, and so some guys don't want to tour, and that might sustain them or bar hop, you know, run errands or whatever. But yeah, once you start getting the eye for the touring game, you start like, okay, this isn't going to work anymore. I'm not getting any younger and my ass hurts. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, story of Matt's life. And then the back seat. I mean, if you want to call it a back seat, I mean, Stacy, she, she'd sit back there with me, but yeah, I mean, that's, wow, that's hardcore. It was not I, comfortable. I loved him a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, so wow. I'm like the guy I'll even get in the back seat of a car before buying the car. I sat on that back seat and it's like, oh my gosh, you are directly on your tailbone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's no, no shit. Oh my God, that was a dedication. Yeah. Dedication. Wow. A lot different than riding on the back of my mom's and my dad's when growing when I was growing up because they both rode too. So What'd they have? Uh, so my mom had a Kawasaki Eliminator and my dad had a 1500 Vulcan Classic growing up. Nice. An Eliminator and a Vulcan Classic. Yeah. yeah the chips bike. Bad chips ass. Bike. Yeah. That is so cool. Yeah, so I, I always wanted to ride. Um, I was a little more delayed because we have s small kids, and so the cost of um, riding was a little bit higher on my on my end with him being deployed all the time. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I was a little later into the riding game. But one of the things that drew me to her, so like in my early military career, you know, early two thousands, I had really gotten into like mountain bike racing. Oh yeah, and then. When I finally got up the nerve to start talking to her, you know, found my in that I'm not just going to be a creeper talking to her. I think she was definitely another a day. She was, <laughs> yeah, there's another thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I think she was actually sitting in the break room with another friend of ours and it was like, Hey, I can go sit with them now and, you know, get, get introduced to her and everything. And then we were talking and I think I was doing something at my house that week and inviting people over. So being the single guy, my house became like the party house for Cabela's. Sure. sure. Yeah. Because you could even see Cabela's from my backyard. Oh, that close. So, yeah. yeah so right. it's like, hey, don't go to the bar. Just pick up a six pack and come to my house. And I had a beer Jenga set built out of two by fours and everything. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. And uh, I invited her over. You know, it's like, okay, you got a boyfriend. That's cool. Bring him over too. You know, we need more people to play, play the game. And she's like, well, I got a mountain bike race this weekend. You got a what? I got a mountain bike race. She was a sponsored downhill mountain bike racer when I met her. So it was just like, wow, very yeah, cool. Yeah, I was pretty awesome. badass. Yeah. Nice. So it was like, at that time, you know, recently divorced and everything, so many of the women I was meeting, they may have had cool stories and stuff, but they, they didn't want, they weren't going to go snowboarding with me. They weren't going to do the things I wanted to do. Yeah. And it's like, look, I'm trying, you know, tired of trying to entertain someone else and be something else for someone else. So meeting Stacy, it was just like, oh my gosh, this this is the girl for me right here. You know, she she's already, you know, sponsored. So she's obviously good. So yeah. That's I just I just badass. had to I just had to keep working at it and hanging on, you know. Yeah. You still doing any of that? 
We sold all of our stuff when we moved from Colorado. Okay. So um, it's been a hot minute, but I would like to get back into it. It's a little harder on the East Coast. I mean, they have some stuff, but West Coast is just, there's no comparison yeah. to, to all the mountains and trails and stuff that we have here. We are pretty blessed around here. Yeah. You know, like I was telling, maybe it was a podcast last week, but you know, you, um, the, the whole country is beautiful, you know, in its own way, in different ways. But, you know, you take for granted uh, the Northwest until you leave here and you go ride the other states like we have and you're like oh we really really have it good where we ride in the beautiful scenery you know but if you don't get out you tend to you tend to take it for granted you know and we'll do our videos even some of our stuff right up here in the yakima river canyon and people are like oh my god i wish i had something like that to ride i'm like but it's just five minutes out my back door it's not that great i mean it's heels but it is it is that it's, great it you is know, but amazing i mean i'm so I've, spoiled so my dad being military and then me being military, there's three states I've not been in. Yeah. Okay. And that's like North Dakota, Wisconsin, or not Wisconsin, excuse me, Minnesota and Alaska. You Those are the only three states been to I've Fargo? never been to. I wouldn't go there either. It's dangerous. I mean- According to the TV show. I'm in that series are, right now, dude. Yeah, people are dying. Left I'm in the middle right of the Fargo, Fargo series, so I didn't go in there. <laughs> you, just, you just have to look out for the wood chippers. Yeah. yeah. No thanks. <laughs> If I'm operating the wood chipper, okay, but you know. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've, I've been to so many states. Um, you know, my, my, where I've ridden motorcycles is still building, but I've been through so much and seen so much that it's like, you know, it's, it's really having the right roads. So yeah, here you've got so many hills and everything, so many canyons that, it's gorgeous. I don't know what happened to the trees on this side of the mountains, but you know, yeah, you right. guys traded your trees for the the, the sagebrush, open, the, the desert, yeah. the desert. So, I mean, coming down today, I was just like, man, the trees just turned off. Yeah, <laughs> they do just turn so, off, don't they? Until you get towards Spokane again, and they start even, picking back up. Yeah. Even when we lived in Colorado, it was just like that. Yeah, Colorado's yeah. cool. I you, love riding in Colorado. But once you hit I twenty five, it's completely yep. different. Yep. So, I mean, Colorado is a gorgeous state. Um, and for the Army, two of the most popular requested uh, posts are here at Fort Lewis and Fort Carson, Colorado. Honestly, having been stationed at both of them, I will take Fort Lewis because at Fort Carson, it took me two plus hours to get to a ski resort. Yeah. Fort Lewis, I could have my stuff packed. And if I got out of work early enough on Friday... I could hit Snoqualmie Pass in an hour and a half mm -hmm. and get enough time with their night skiing that, you know, I was, I was good. So I actually enjoyed here more than I did Colorado. Yeah. You know, and I didn't get to do enough riding here because I was so busy working the second job, but Colorado. Oh yeah. I got, I got plenty of riding there. I mean, shoot, even uh 2020 when Russell and I were heading out to meet with you guys, we did the iron butt from Tennessee to Colorado Springs. And then the next day, because he said he had never done it, I took Russell up uh, Pikes Peak. And coming from not being acclimated anymore from you know, yeah. living in Colorado. Chilly up there. Not only was it chilly up there, okay. <laughs> and that's that was that was the thing. I don't care if it's August, you gotta be ready for winter conditions up there. You guys have done rides like this. Yep. Bear tooth similar. Yep, bear tooth similar. Now I gotta look up how high Russell, Pikes Peak is. 14,115 feet. Yeah, it there just raised like a foot. Nice. They just raised it five feet, actually. Five, five they, feet. They, re, they finally, so the, oh, when we happened? lived there, when we lived there, the parking lot was still gravel. Yeah. When Russell and I went in 2020, they were finishing the parking lot and oh. they brought in fill dirt and made it five feet Oh higher. my God, dude. And they actually changed it for that. Yeah. Oh, wow. So my patch is obsolete because my patch <laughs> says, still says, you know, 110, not 115. Just add so. a plus gravel, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like plus tax, plus gravel. But uh, yeah, so Russell and I were feeling the effects up there um, from the oxygen and then it started to snow and it was like, okay. The fun is done. It is time to get off this mountain. You know, yeah. We've got to get down where there's oxygen and it's not snowing on us. So. <laughs> but that was that was a great experience. You know, I I was so happy to be able to take Russell up there because yeah. you know he's done so much for the law-abiding biker community. You know, things he's done. You know, he's come out here. He's 
shot video with you. He's done, you know, episodes like this with you. And that was probably one of the best things about getting stationed in Tennessee. The other is being a part of the 101st Airborne. But being close enough to meet Russell Roberts and and Sherry, just, and, Sherry and they're yeah. such wonderful people that you I mean you you've met you've met Russell. I don't know if you've met his wife Sherry. Yeah, we only on uh, we did a couple of weeks ago on FaceTime because right. okay. we were planning and she came on. We'll see her this summer. Yeah, you'll see you'll will. see them both this summer. Russell's been right in your seat right yeah. there yep. on this podcast. Yeah. I'm I'm honored to, you know, sit yeah. in the same seat as as him. <laughs> So no, meeting them was just so great. And what it was is where we were living, um, his daughters went to the college there Mm -hmm. and he had posted something one day in, you know, Facebook stalking or something, you know, I I saw, oh, he's he's over at the college looking at the football game because his daughter was in the marching band. And he's like, hey, if you're not doing anything, the Harley dealership's having like a a hot dog night or something. They were having something. Hogs like and dogs. Yeah. They were having something like that. And he's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll meet you there. So that was the first time I met him. And then we would, we would go on rides together and Oh my gosh, riding with Russell is you're never going to get lost. Yeah. He knows every road across this country. I mean, doing the road trip to yeah. Sturgis, he knew like, Hey, we're not going to take the interstate. We're going to bump an hour North and take this highway and there won't be any traffic. And it yeah. was so much easier. Or just riding around Tennessee, you know, because at one point he was like a delivery driver for a bread company. So he knows all the roads around yeah. central Tennessee. Like, I mean, the super back roads and everything. So the ride this summer, he hasn't told me where we're going, but I know it's going to be good. Cause I mean, we're riding right in my backyard from when I lived there. So it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, we're doing our East Coast trip. This that's where we're going this year. And so, as we're riding after the patron event, he gave us some. We definitely dialed in on his mm-hmm. expertise uh, to get uh, uh, some some good riding through there. Uh, Anthony, you like Ciro stuff? Oh my gosh, I absolutely love Ciro stuff. Well, let's see how you do In a fact, commercial. You better go. <laughs> oh gosh, you, can <laughs> you don't hey, have to searching for stuff. new and exciting motorcycle products. Ciro three. Zero 3D has the products you dream about for your bike. I can act. I'm going to go off script here. Do it. Okay. Just do your own commercial. Zero so, not yeah, only like has stuff for your Harley Davidson and your Goldwing. Zero now has a line just for Indians as yeah, well. Yeah, they do, bro. My old my old Street Glide that I used to have. That thing was like a rolling advertisement <laughs> for Zero. I like it. Now, now yeah, you yeah. can even do that with your with your Indian motorcycle. So. If you want to look good, you got to get the Ciro on there. If you want to be seen, that's the way to be seen is the Ciro LED products. Yeah. Then they have been uh, uh, adding a lot of Indian stuff over the years. I know they're committed to that and uh, just a great company of bikers, guys. Um, that's why we carry all their stuff right in the Law Abiding Biker Store. We've got the Indian stuff in there too now, Lurch. Do we have listings for that? We're always adding, maybe not. Oh, I don't know if we do. I just uh, think I've, I've got some product I need to Yeah, we're add. always adding new stuff to the we store. We get it though. Nonetheless, you can always get it from us if it's not listed on our store yet. You just hit us up at the uh, contact form on our website. But if you've got a question, you certainly can get in touch with uh, Ciro at sales at Ciro3D.com. Give them a call, 715-808-0027. And uh, yeah, so uh, hopefully they just continue to keep adding more Indian stuff. I know when we were down in Sturgis, they were uh, putting out a bunch of Indian stuff then too and had some ha- had been committed because obviously they started with Hardy and then um, started uh, developing all that stuff. So yeah, great yeah. company, good people. I was uh, So we did Sturgis this year and I was actually stopped by the booth again. Oh yeah? And I was talking to him. I was like, hey, I had all of this on my street glide. Now I want it on my Indian. And he said, wait until October. And no kidding. It was, I think it was like September 30th and they already had the stuff on the website, but it was saying like not available. Yeah. So once it hit the first, they released that stuff. And I mean, so much of the good products that you can put on your street glide or Mm -hmm. your road glide. Now they have, it's not identical. So your Indian is still going to be unique, but it's modified a little bit so that Mm -hmm. it's, you know, just like your Indian doesn't look exactly like the Harley. Boom. Here, the Ciro products look a little bit different and a little more unique. So 
you're still going to be unique with the cereal products on your Indian. Yep. Very cool. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, yeah. And like I say, guys, you can hit us up at the store. If you want to get it, we can certainly get it ordered up for you. We do need to add more of that over time. We're just trying to add stuff as, as quickly as we can. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to back up just a little bit here. Um, cause we, we just completely go off script here, but, uh, I will, I will say, uh, you by far, uh, the, cause we've had a lot of patron members on the mics before, but this guy straight up made notes as good as Lurch makes notes for podcasts. I mean, like he was an employee. So I didn't even have a template. I was just hats guessing. Off. That's what we that's do. Looks like what we'd normally do. This is do. how we yeah. do. We just use this program where we can minimize and it just helps us get through stuff. But uh, you made them. That's all we do is bullet points. And so it was, it's very helpful. Very helpful. I was going to back up a little bit, uh, not to necessarily bust your balls, but to, to say how living in different areas, how we get like, uh, take for granted our area. So here, oh yeah, case in point, you're going to think I'm such a snob. So uh, I actually was busy, and I, so uh, Anthony snowboards. You snowboard too, Stacy. Snowboard and ski. And ski. Okay, yeah. I grew up skiing and snowboard now, so I, yeah. I can do both. But um, Anthony went up. Uh, was it the day before Christmas Eve day? Uh, was it the twenty third? No, it was two days before. It was Saturday before Christmas. Okay, Saturday, and I was just yeah. completely tied up with family stuff, but. He's in town, obviously, and uh, we were going to try to get together and go snowboard. That's not dead yet. We'll see. But uh, so here's the here's the snobbish thing. I just want to tell you, having lived here, so it's funny because Anthony goes up now. Number one, White Pass is about an hour from here, so an hour I can be on the slopes. Me and my daughter go. We have seasons passes. We go every chance we get. But we're so snobbish, um, and this is not the reason I didn't go. I would go just because you were in town. Only the, we've had a. This is actually kind of common. A lot, our biggest snow months are January, February, and March. A lot of people think it's December and November. It's not. So there's a lot of times in the past where it really hasn't even been open at Christmas. So the fact that it's open before Christmas is good, but only a part of the mountain is open. So um, the funny thing is people around here, like me being a complete, and I feel bad, I'm like a snob. uh, We don't even really go up. and, And you sent me a picture and said, it's just awesome. And we're all like, Around here, we're like, we don't even go there up were, on days like that. There were still little trees poking through the yeah. snow, yeah. so that's too much of a hassle. Only for part Ryan, of the mountain's evidently. open. They're making fake snow. It's way and better than the East Coast. I know, though. and that's East what's Coast funny. Snow sucks. And so I love that he sent me that because it may, it puts me in a perspective of like, oh, he, you know, this is really good compared to where they go. And people around here are like, we look at the weather, we're like, that's a shit day. We're not even going to waste our time, you know, and it's not. In, in in your perspective, so it's funny, and I I need to yeah, remember no, it, that that is, I we're so it blessed. It is funny, and I was just I was just busting your balls. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you were like, you know, it's like, hey Ryan, you want to go? You're like, oh no, they still got. I'm hearing they still got bald spots and this and that. Only Not, part of the mountains open. Yeah, the upper lodge isn't mountain, even open. You know, it's like you go is like mid East Coast where we live. You know, unless you find some hole in the wall place in West Virginia that just yeah. like has happens to be like where all the snow dumps or something, you're going to have man-made stuff. It's going to be icy. It's going to be rough. You know, here- It's awesome. We don't even go up. We literally, we look at the weather, we're like, I ain't going up. Not a foot of powder? Fuck that. You you wait another (laughs) month here, and you're going to have the wells around the tree that people can fall in and die. Correct. You know, Mm -hmm. but no, one of the things I loved, like being out here and going snowboarding is from like Thanksgiving until Cinco de Mayo. I mean- if I'm not going to be picky about my conditions, right, right, you know, I can. I have that I've luxury. Got, you have that luxury. Right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, and my thing, you know, I, I like getting as much for my buck as I can. So if I'm buying a season ticket, I've already done the math that realizes, okay, I got to go three to four times just to pay for this thing. So I'm going to try to go four times in a month at least. Yeah, right. So anything after that is like, oh, bonus. Correct. Yes, you know. Correct. So, but it's, it's, it's even like that with the riding. So here in Washington, you have so many nice hills and canyons and, you know, whether, whether you're over towards the peninsula where there's more trees or, you know, you're here in central Washington or whatever, you have some very, very beautiful rides. Okay. And like, even this past summer taking, you know, taking Stacy and two of our other friends that had never been to Sturgis and especially on the East Coast, or you, you, you get that guy that's never been to Sturgis, like, yeah, I want to go, but I want to ride. They quickly learned, 
no, you don't want to ride. <laughs> okay. Because once you hit Champaign, Illinois, <laughs> coming from the yeah. east, it's yeah. a lot of corn. You get to see a lot of straight, flat roads and corn. Yeah. Corn until and you soy. Get, until you get to about Wall, South Dakota. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then there's something to see. Yeah. So, and yeah. So we, we, we trailered <laughs> this year. You know, right. no shame in that. No, no shame. Because, and we actually went the week before because. I wanted them, I've, I've, this was my third time at Sturgis and she's never been able to go with me. And I wanted her to experience riding the Black Hills, you know, and everybody's like, oh yeah, you guys are going to Sturgis. It's like, nah, I'll take them through Sturgis. Right. But I want them to experience riding the Black Hills because that is just so majestic. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've done it a number of times too. So, yeah, you know, that's, that's what we were going for. But yeah, just like, with the mountains, you know, getting back on track. Mm-hmm. Just like with the mountains, you get spoiled because you get much better snow. For reference, if you've never been to White Pass, where Ryan's talking about us going, um, I just gave the family like lessons and the beginner slope. The beginner slope at White Pass is like the whole mountain where we That live. is so crazy yes. to me. God, so that, that is that so one crazy. Lift, that one lift that goes halfway up the mountain. Yeah, it's the sm- far east chair. That'll be the whole mountain. That where is we insanity. Live. I didn't. It's weird because I've never been to a place like that skiing. Right. I've always went to these, you know, great places. Where out you here. have the mul- yeah. multi stops. So that you have the stop yeah. halfway through that you can grab yes. the drink. Yeah. Even when yep. we were in Colorado, you'd have the giant mountain. Yeah. Where oh, yeah. It's, yeah. You know, you go up to the top, and it's a three mile snowboard ride or ski all the way to the bottom and they've got a rest area on the way down because your yep. legs are getting tired. Yeah, little yurts where you can grab a beer yeah, and things that's, and that's whatever. That's not East Coast. Even <laughs> if I go up to New Hampshire, no, the mountain's not that big. Yeah, so wow. So it's, it's, it is a majestic adventure skiing out here or even riding out here. Have you been up when before to White Pass in the past? No, that was so my your first, first trip. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've done, we're going to get done, you on that backside. The other oh, Once you get back to Basin and Kalora, was it open? So yeah, yeah. So I, I just did one. So it while, says it's closed. The back. No, the I went back, down the back side. And that's went, the green chair. Yeah. I went down the back side. Okay. They had two lifts back there open. And then I came all the way back around to the front. Okay. You did go on, you went on. Yeah. I know which chair, but that, the actual other two big chairs that are back there are closed. The oh, color and got basin. That second peak back yes. there. Yeah, the second no, peak's all closed. There. That's why only part of the mountain's open. But yeah. yeah, there is a back. I know where you're talking about, but that's not the actual uh, hog. Hogback Basin, where they see that's like why 10, I wanted 11 you years. there, man. I, know, I don't dude. know this stuff. I know that's know? all right. That's like we that's couldn't like, even go on it, but uh, yeah, oh, we got to get you like up the here second time on I a went pow to, day when we get a foot of talcum uh, powder and have, you're just I'll going down, making turns, and it's just blowing over you like in the movies in your face. That's real shit up there, man. Well, we got to come back for a back. wedding in February. Yeah, so. we're back in February for a wedding. That's gonna. Can I take him out of bounds? Am I allowed to take him? Because I don't stay in bounds. We're way out of bounds. I know that. I'm like Russell with that. A while, but I grew up on that. As long as you're gentle with him. Okay, I'll be gentle. I'll be gentle. Nothing's out of bounds. I'll spit first. Don't worry. About it. I appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you. Ryan is a gentle lover. Uh, yeah, we could, we got to we got to come back. Way at the no, we'll stay, we'll stay wherever wedding, you want to so, go. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, maybe I'll have to add a day or two and you know pop down here from Leavenworth. So let me know. I would love actually to get up there with you and just okay. regardless of what the weather. I don't care. All if, when guys are in town and they want to go, I then I go. No problem. Then now um, it's not me calling you a couple days ahead of time. Like hey Ryan. So, oh no, that's all right. If yeah. I can make it work, I will. Um, but planning, obviously that's okay. fine too. But even if you don't, a lot of times I can get off on a whim, you know, and take a day off or something, but careful. Yeah. We're talking about this on a podcast. Yeah, Next right. thing you know, it's going to be the lab community at, yeah, no at White Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Law abiding <laughs> <new> borders. <laughs> well, there's, Ryan, a, there's our new community. Ryan, make sure you submit your day off request to me. <laughs> I, will, I will, for sure. I'll HR's get, tracking. Yeah, I'll get it in, get it in on time. Anyways, I just, I digress a little bit, but I want to go back to that because it, 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 it uh, met the, what I was talking about, about being, you know, so spoiled and getting on our own element. And then you get out of that and you start realizing how sometimes how good you have it where you live, you know? So, um, all right. So let's keep moving forward here. We got, uh, so we are up to, Oh yeah. Keep me on track. Cause I'll yeah, go off we'll, on tangents, man. We're already, he will talk forever. Oh, I know. I Perfect. Love it. That's what this is all. I about. love these yeah. episodes. I mean, you will talk until four o'clock when we have to go live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you guys didn't know, the uh, we are going to do a live episode, so look forward to that. That'll come out in regular podcast format, too, because uh, it's all about Indian, because uh, uh, Indian motorcycles, um, 
because Anthony made a switch, what, a year ago or something? We're not going to get deep into it, but no, or, so has it been longer for, than that? Well, for our household, the switch started in With me. 21. He okay. copied me. A gotcha. little bit, yes. It was it was a lot of her influence, yes. Okay. So, so she she was on, I had a Dyna for her, and she was never really happy on it, and she really liked the way the Scout Bobber looked. Mm. So It was sexy. Yep. Mm. Nice. 21, 21, we got her a Scout Bobber. 22, I got a Challenger, and then this year at Sturgis, at Sturgis she came home with a Chieftain. Yeah, Chieftain Dark Horse, let's be specific. Yeah, nice. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. On the interwebs. It's way sexier. Black, you know, once you go black, you don't go back. Oh, that's what they say. my goodness, that's what they say. Uh, so that's going to be a good episode because I'm curious to dive in deeper on all that. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's what the next uh, live episode, and of course, it'll come out in regular podcast format. So did we talk about your second accident? Have we got into that? Yeah. Yet? So, all right, yeah, let's that move was, on to that. So, okay, so yeah. You got let, nine lives. He's like a cat. <laughs> I think I went through more than nine, <laughs> yeah. so I don't know why. Me I too. I, I've actually been told a lot of lives. So. <laughs> I'm starting to wonder I've about my mortality. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. So, but uh, yeah, so, you know, 2012 left Washington. 2013 was in uh, North Carolina. And then after that, I went to uh, Colorado. Colorado, Fort Carson, Colorado. Um, not long after being in Fort Carson, Colorado, I finally upgraded from the Sportster to a 2004 Fat Boy. And that bike was just so amazing. It was, you know, I went from an 883 to an 88 cubic inch. Um, it had the mini apes on it. It had an adjustable tombstone windshield. So that was actually really useful and very unique. I think a tombstone, never heard of it. Wow. So yeah, the tombstone was kind of like split in half and I could, it had a uh, tensioner so you could actually raise it about four inches oh, wow. or lower it about four inches. Mm. Um, and it was quick release so I could take it all the way off too. So oh, nice. it, was, yeah. it was just so great. And um, a lot of times in the military, especially when you hit a certain rank, you, you are going to be given some sort of extra collateral duty. And that's about the time I realized, hey, I need to volunteer to be the motorcycle mentor. Oh, nice. Yeah. Because I had already been the sexual harassment guy, the equal opportunity guy. I had had to help victims and everything. And it was not something I enjoyed. So it was like, I'm going to volunteer for a job before they assign me one I don't like. At least they assign an expert in sexual harassment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it worked for him slightly. <laughs> 11 Just, years later, here I am. Yeah. He needs to come in and gut our company. We have a lot of problems with sexual <laughs> harassment. And uh, yeah, just yeah, saying. Yeah, no, I, 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 that, I, <laughs> I it's did currently the job you and well, me. but I did not like <laughs> it. Yeah, a lot of it going on. Who's harassing you, buddy? <laughs> Where's the dog? He's hiding. Yeah, he is. He's, over He's here the one now. getting harassed, I think. Yeah. <laughs> With the dude wipes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he does get violated, but it's for his own good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we were, in, we were in Colorado. I got the fat boy and... Shoot, I didn't even, I deployed in 2015 and it was after I came back from that deployment. And then that's about the same time I discovered your videos. Um, and this, this is how cheap I was at the time. I remember needing an oil change on that fat boy and I went down to the auto parts store and I'd already, you know, started doing my research. Do you need motorcycle oil? Oh, you or, went the you diesel? Know, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Rotella? Like I, Big Daddy? You know, <laughs> because I did my homework, I realized, no, you don't need any of that stuff. Right. That's just a way for them to mark up the mm -hmm. price. Mm -hmm. So I go down to, I don't know what parts store it was, but I walk in and it was like, hey, I need, you know, I need this grade oil. And the new guy behind the counter is like, oh, you need motorcycle oil. I was like, no, I don't want to pay extra for it. I just need this, you know, this weight. And the manager was like, do you care, you know, how old it is? Not really. I mean, if it's in the container, I'll it's good, I'll take slightly right? used at this point. This guy, <laughs> he had like two gallons of Valvoline that was discontinued oh. that he sold me for a buck each. So nice. I was like, yes. So I got like three oil changes out of that nice. for, you know, and all I had to do was pay for filters basically. So, yeah. but it was like right after I did the third filter, I was riding home from work and it was one of those. It, so in Colorado or in Colorado Springs, you can watch the weather patterns come around Pike's peak. Okay. Especially where we lived, we lived on the East side of like the, the Valley that Colorado Springs mm. resides in. And so we had a, 
great view of the mountain. So I could tell, okay, the clouds are coming south of the peak. They're going to hit us. If they're going north of the peak, they're going to miss us. I was at work and, you know, boom, it just starts downpouring. It's like, oh man, okay, I got to wait for this to stop before I go home. It was even hail. He called me and was like, <coughs> I, was, I told him to wait and he didn't wait. Well, I, I waited a little bit. So <laughs> at home, it had not stopped raining. But in Colorado, I mean, it'll start raining and stop raining, like flipping on and off a switch. And so once it passed, it was like, okay, give it a little bit to move further down the road. And then I got to go during the break. I caught up to the hail. <laughs> so that was not fun. So now I'm dealing with hail just getting pelted with this stuff. Do you have your windshield on to help at all? I had all? the windshield on, but like I mentioned earlier, I was only wearing a novelty helmet. Oh, nice. It Even was this better. really cool three-quarter novelty helmet. You looked I'm cool in the hail. Oh, yeah. In the yeah. hail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that the one that you had know, like the flames? Yeah, it had yeah. like the gold oh. flames it painted like on it. looked like you was going super fast. I had the, you know, I had the yeah, bandana right, right. over my face, you know, trying to protect my face. And I had like these terrible $3 safety lenses on yeah. that are fogging up from my breath and everything. And I'm maybe a mile and a half from the house. And I mean, it's just the roads are flooding from the rain coming down and everything. And it's like, Oh, this is so terrible. And I'm about to make the last turn to go to the house. And I've got a car on the left. I've got a car on the right. I go to make the left turn, and next thing I know, there's a Jeep Cherokee right there, and he T-bones me. And it was, I don't know how many times I flipped in the air, but I was just laid out in the road, and I remember going through the air, and all I thought of was cover my face, because I had a three-quarter on. And I tumbled and was just laid out in the road. And, you know, okay, I stopped moving, opened my eyes, People are looking at me like, oh my gosh, this guy's dead. Um, I wasn't. And it's like, okay, so. Not until he got home. Yep. Scary shit. Gentleman comes over. I give him my phone. I was like, hey, call my wife. And we're in like a sketchy cell phone area. So she gets this weird broken phone call. Yeah, I get a broken phone call yeah. of somebody's voice that I don't know from my husband's phone. Oh my and God. all I heard was like cross street. So I knew exactly where he was at. And then I got, I heard the ambulance come. <laughs> Which yeah, was conveniently she hears the ambulance act, passing the house. Which was conveniently actually one of my girlfriends from high school was the responding EMT oh, wow. to, to his motorcycle accident. We had been trying to get together, and that was the first time that she met him wow. with his pants split and just oh, yeah. <laughs> laid out so, on the ground. Yeah, by the uh. time by the time EMS gets there, they're like, "Okay, let's let's get you up and take you to the ambulance." I was like, "Okay, I can get up." And yeah, when I got up and walked over to the ambulance, people looked at me like Lazarus just rose from the dead. Jesus. I mean, they could not believe this. But yeah, my trousers were ripped from like the crotch to the knee. So here I am meeting her friend for the first time with, you know, hey, how you doing? Um, yeah. So, but uh, ended up ended up going to the ER just to get checked out, um, but not in the ambulance. Stacy drove me on base. Wow. Um, and they were just they were just amazed that there was not any like real trauma or anything. But I was originally cited on that for failing to yield and had to go to court to prove that in those conditions where everything is just silver and gray, and this gentleman was driving a silver Jeep Cherokee without his lights on. In Colorado, you have to have your lights on. At a thousand, if you, so the Colorado law- At all if, times? If, no, if you can't be seen from a thousand feet- Oh yeah, same, okay. You have weather. to have the in, your, your lights on. We I didn't see this guy, here, yeah. I couldn't see this guy a hundred feet away. And, but I had to go to court and- Was it an intersection, obviously? Yes. Was but, it a four-way stop or stop in one I, direction? He, or? No, it was just the, the two roads coming from the sides had stop signs. Okay. He and I did not- Oh, but because I did not see him, I turned in front of him. Okay, so you made a left turn in front of him because you didn't right. see him coming. That's, out. Why, I got you. I, that's why he was cited. First. I got you. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, but it, what it was is, it was like five o'clock in the evening. The sun was still peeking out under the clouds, and I'm headed east uphill. So yeah. it just turned the road into this giant silver surface. Yeah, that's tough. That I couldn't see the silver car. Right. So. Yeah, so that was that was a rough one. Um, 
Dude, you had no broken bones or anything? No. Oh my God, just, dude. Just beat His up. back I is mean, still jacked up. Yeah, though. my... It, it's yeah, I still pay for it. A um, mixture between the motorcycle accident and his service, and just yeah, years of abuse on my body. Yeah, yeah, right, so, right. The, the, I mean, you gotta think. I got I got selected for to go play with the special kids when I was thirty seven. So yeah. I was out there at thirty eight, and then later in my career, I even went through air assault school at 43 years old and I was the oldest guy in my class and they were just impressed that I was not dead. Yeah, dude, <laughs> yeah. That, that is amazing. So did you have any, uh, I got to ask cause we've talked about gear and I'm guilty of it too. When I was younger, um, did, did that give you any wake up calls? Like looking at ripped jeans, like, you know, you can get in crashes. Maybe I should get a real helmet. Maybe I should get gloves. Maybe I should get like protective riding jeans and good shoes. Anything cross your mind like that? It, it does. Um, you know, I, I don't wear novelty helmets as a result <laughs> anymore. Um, I'll still wear, you know, halves or three quarters occasionally. I, I will wear a half helmet. Yeah. But it's, 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 it's a DOT half helmet. Right. Right. Um, I will evaluate weather and such a lot more stringently yeah. now. Um, one of the problems during that accident was cheap eye pro. Oh yeah. I don't wear cheap eye pro anymore. I mean, I've, I've got these gators here. Yeah. Those things start at like $300, but they're made out of aircraft aluminum and you can go skydiving with them. I mean, yeah, they're, they're yeah. incredible. So I've got like my tinted pair and then I've got my transition pair. The transition pair is great because it's eye pro but they're tinted when I need them to be. And then, mm -hmm. oops, I stayed out a little bit later than I thought. Okay, I've got clear lenses to still ride home with. So, yep. yeah. It's, yeah, you it's, start thinking about that stuff. It's yeah. definitely made a difference in my safety equipment. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, am, am I the guy that's always wearing riding pants? No, I'm, I'm kind of a, well, not kind of, I'm a cheap ass. Yeah, yeah, so, I get it. You know, would I like to have all the pants that you talk about and everything? Yes, I would. I have trouble spending money yeah. on myself. I'll spend money on her and the kids all day long, but buying a $200 pair of pants for I get myself, it. it's like- My oh. wife's always like that. Just buy it. You deserve it. I'm like, yeah, I don't really need it, you know? But right. I feel like I'm taking from the family. Yeah. It's that good that, German you know. NM. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. So, but yeah, it, it's, 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 had, it's had an impact on the safety equipment I use. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know- it, 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 it's a little bit of a struggle when you're active duty because, you know, yes, they make you wear full sleeves and everything, you know, Gloves. you have to have, you know, proper attire on. And that was one of the things, you know, yeah, my whole time all, or all the years I was a motorcycle mentor, the only accident I had to deal with was my own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, right. But, you know, in the investigation, you know, that determined, yes, this was a line of duty accident because I was going home from work. Oh, okay. Okay. Was he wearing proper attire? And it was like, yes, because nobody. Right. Nobody checked Nobody his noticed right, that right. it was a novel. Right, right. It looked, it looked real. <laughs> yeah, it looked good. It was a three quarter. It must be real, right? <laughs> yeah. A lot of people so, have no clue. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but that was the last time. I mean, that, that, that helmet made it through the accident just fine, but that was the last time I wore it again. So I think a buddy of mine wanted it just as kind of a decoration for his garage or something. So I gave it to him, but yeah, I, I you know, not gonna, not gonna play that game again. Um, that's just, and it, the surprising thing is that I was wearing the novelty helmet to begin with, because when I lived here in Washington, snowboarding, I had given myself a pretty good concussion mm, Yeah, and because I was, you know, it, we grew up in an age where you made fun of the kid with a helmet. We didn't, you couldn't even get it. Speaking of BMX bikes back in the day, like it wasn't even, people don't realize that. I tried to tell my kids like, in a race, how no. did you do all that without, I go, honey, you don't understand. It was a different time. There wasn't the internet. Uh, there wasn't even, it, they didn't, you could buy a bike at a bicycle shop. They, there wasn't even helmets for, for sale in the bicycle shop. Like it was like seatbelts, you know, it, yeah. when I was a kid, they finally started putting seatbelts in some of the cars. I remember you know, and, my brother competed in a BMX race once and the helmet, he looked like, or he wore looked like something out of the special ed class. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I don't know, or maybe it was like a hockey helmet or something. Yeah. And it was just like, okay, wear that for racing. That's, that's the only time. Right. That's weird. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But no, I, so yeah, now even like, uh, you know, skiing, snowboarding and stuff is like, oh yeah, I've, I mean, that was a really good concussion I gave myself and I was by myself here at Snoqualmie oh, boy, that's scary, and had yeah. to drive an hour and a half home I couldn't even see straight. I wouldn't have been surprised if an officer pulled me over thinking I was drunk. Yeah. 
because yeah. my vision was distorted. That's how bad it was. But, and then from then on, it's like always with the helmet, always with other people. Yeah. We get because older, I wiser. Yep. I, get, I, I hate wearing it too, but I do just because I can't afford to be well, out. Then we well, extrapolate I've, that I've, I've to lost the kids enough, too. you know, <laughs> enough brain cells that I don't need to lose them that Correct. Way, so. Correct. Yeah. Same here. Same here. Let's do this real quick and then we'll uh, lurch. You want to do this? You're not talking a bunch. Are you searching for the easiest and quickest detachable luggage system for your motorcycle? Rick Rack has just what you're looking for. Forget all those frustrating straps and bungee cords that come loose and slap your paint. Check out one of Rick Rack's awesome quick attach strapless luggage rack systems. This father and son team designed something really special that you can't find anywhere else. Yep, these guys ride so they truly understand the needs of bikers. The Rick Rack quick attach system is strong, durable, and secure with a lockable system. Also, check out their full line of turning bags to accompany your quick detach system. Once you, oops, sorry. Also, check out the good lord. Once, Once you use a rick rack, you'll never go back. Rick rack. I made the mistake. Good to look down my, my my watch is vibrating. Sorry. Uh, what are you waiting for, bike hogs? Head on over to Law Abiding Biker Store and check out our full line of rick rack systems and bags. Lawbidingbiker.com forward slash store. And we do have the rick rack for the Indians. In our store, you guys Just rocking it big time. or not? Some guys do, uh, some don't. It depends how your setup so I'm is. I'm still rocking the saddlebag cooler. Oh, so yeah, bro. That's, that's interchangeable from you know, whatever you <laughs> that's got. Right. So, yeah, I'm still rocking. I remember you the, getting that at uh, Sturgis. Dude, yeah, I was when walking we around at, with at it. You know, you were, yeah, when we were at Cold Black Pierce, Hills. Dude. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like I said, I'm cheap, man. If I can bring it, that was the first time I met you. And yep. that was before the patron. Was that before? That was the, so you were having the meet and greet the at meet both the Ciro and, and Rick Rack. The mm-hmm. Rick Rack, yeah. So, I remember that. You were the ride the next day. That's right. It was the next day. Yeah, yeah. Oh, dude. Hey, you know, you know how, to, how to be social. You he know, had I cigars had beers with me. You know, beers yeah, over his. Yeah. Yeah, that was badass, dude. Yeah, that's a good use of the old uh, Rick Rack cooler. Uh, all right. So we are, uh, yeah, we're doing good on time. Let's uh, move yeah. from there. Let's go. Let's see what we got here. He's got all kinds of. So, music. yeah, that was the number two good. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about Iraq real quick. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So that was, that was a big time for me and another time that, this podcast meant so much to me. So being in the army, your, your deployments are nine months long, um, go over to Iraq and I am on this small, small compound, this overcrowded compound. And you know, it's, it's just like when I had the motorcycle accident, I couldn't wait to get my next bike. You know, for two months I had no bike cause I'm dealing with the insurance companies and everything. And it's like, you're, you're the junkie. You need your fix. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? bro. Mm-hmm. So while I was in Iraq, I was going back and I was, you know, getting getting episodes and watching episodes and listening to the channel and everything. And that was my fix. And then one of the great things, so when I was over there, because obviously it's such a great time difference, um, when you would do the live podcast, mm-hmm. that was like four o'clock yeah, in the morning bro. for me. <laughs> so I'd wake up and I'd go hit the, uh, where they got the 24 hour coffee. I'd go get my coffee. And then I'd say good morning to David Schwartz, our good buddy over yeah. in Israel and everything. Cause he was having his morning drink too. So, you know, that's badass. Both of us were on the same time zone. So yeah, it was, it was, it was great. You know, I'd, we'd have our little, you know, talk and stuff. So no, it was, it was, that was always the thing. And I'd even tell like my, my, subordinate that I would do shifts with, um, Hey, I might be a little bit late this morning if they run over. Okay. <laughs> so he's like, okay, gotcha. Yeah. You know, Cause it was like, we had to go on shift at six o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I think I it, remember you guys saying that in chat, like the time it was. And yeah. Stuff. Like, Holy yeah. Shit, man. Yeah. It was, it was early for us. So, so when David Schwartz gets on a lot of these, it's like, yeah, he's super early in the morning. So that's some serious dedication or like the, uh, the patrons down in places like Australia and yeah, stuff. Right. It's like, oh my gosh, what time is it for them in Australia? I mean, I get, well, we're here on, we're here in the Pacific. So Australia is maybe what, five hours ahead or something. I don't know, but it, yeah. I doubt it's at a convenient time. So Right. No, we've been asked about that yeah. in the past. We try to do them at different times, but for us to do them, I've, we'd I've have to do them at like four started, in the morning. Yeah, I've noticed yeah. you've started varying the times and stuff. And yeah. Trying to. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's really appreciated, you know, throughout the community, you know, everybody wants to be able to listen, wants to be able to participate. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so much fun when you do the live ones and especially those of us that have met each other at different rides and stuff, whether it's a sanctioned or non-sanctioned ride, it's like, Hey, how's it going? How's, you know, it's, it's, 
that live time that we have together as well, you know. Yep, being part so. of the conversation and then a lot of side conversations go on in the lives, which I love. We'll be doing the live and then you guys are talking about other stuff in there and we don't, we love it. It's just yep. a, you know, it's a community. It's time that everybody's on together because, you know, Facebook is, or whatever, a group is replying to posts that have already been posted, but that's like real time. So it's really cool. It's really cool to see how that's blowing up over the years. Yeah. yeah. And then even before going over to that, that deployment in Iraq, I had reached out to uh, Big Daddy and I was like, hey, I'm going over to Iraq. You know, people will have like unit stickers and stuff like this or just, you know, whatever goofy sticker they have and they'll slap them up different places. Um, and I was like, what do I got to do to get some, some lab yeah. stickers? And he's like, just send me an address. Okay. As soon as I get over there and figure out what my address is, I'll let you know. And yeah, it took, it took me a couple of weeks, you know, to finally get settled in and get an address. And I, I sent it to him and I still have stickers. Nice. That's how many he sent me. <laughs> Good. You know? Good. I mean, the old big square ones. Oh, I yeah. I still have them. Nice. <laughs> you know, I still have nice. a few of them. The originals, yeah. the OG stickers. Because yeah. he just took, he, he said he just grabbed a stack in the store, threw them in an envelope and sent them to me. And I was like, cool, man. What do I owe you for him? He's like, don't worry about it. And that's that's when I just spent any time I went someplace so awesome. in Iraq. And I the plan was I was supposed to move around a lot more. But then things got a little mixed up. They sent my boss home. So that meant I had to stay in Baghdad more rather than traveling around. But when I did get moving, when I did go around, that's when I was just like putting the stickers up everywhere I could. Because, you know, every every room I stayed in, every base I went to, you know, I put it up there because that was my way. Yeah, there we go. He's, Look at this, he's, got, he's got the picture, <laughs> you know, picture of me. You can't see the butt chin that, that well. That, <laughs> a little bit but there. You yeah. can see a little bit. I think that's... He looks like a totally different human. Yeah, I think that picture is when I was up in uh, Kirkuk. Yeah, you were. So, yep. So, For yeah. those listening, I... Put one into our patron only Facebook group and pulled up some of the pictures. <laughs> nice, yeah. nice. Yeah, I remember you sending those pictures in there. Yeah, I thought that was so oh, bad. I think we announced yeah. it on a podcast. You did. You, yeah. And honestly, yeah. that was after I came home. You had uh, Cowboy and Popeye yeah. here, and you guys were talking about it. I didn't hear about it for like a few months because I think we were on leave or somebody, something, and I missed the live episode. So, but yeah, that was. That was me just trying to help any other motorcycle rider I could. Like, hey, this is a great place, you know, great documentaries for you to listen to, great podcast to listen to. Um, I remember even like halfway through the deployment, I moved into a new room and somebody who had lived there had like a BMW motorcycle calendar. Yeah. And they had still had the pictures up and I was just like, Okay, this helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I got motorcycle stuff around me. All right, you know, but yeah. No, it was it was really rough. Um so we were on Union 3, which is right across the street from the embassy in Baghdad, but it is such a small facility with a lot of people on it. Um whereas there's other bases I can go to and it's like there's more than enough room and plenty of recreational things to do. There was not here. Mm. Um once a week I had the cigar club. So Saturday nights was our combat cigar club where we would meet on top of a building and smoke cigars. Um, that was pretty cool. Uh, and anybody that wanted to talk motorcycles at those, I talked motorcycles with them. So, yeah. <laughs> and there were, there were other, there were other folks, not even Americans. Cause we had a lot of, you know, coalition forces on this base that, yeah, they were interested. You know, I, I had, Danish partners and stuff. They're like, man, I would love to have a Harley Davidson, but in Denmark, that just, uh, uh-uh. they're, they're, they're high theft. Unless you have a garage and you have an anchor built into the concrete foundation of the garage floor that you chain your bike to nightly, it's probably going to get stolen. Wow. Yeah. So no, I, I had, I had plenty of, you know, friends that, that did want to talk motorcycles. It wasn't just the weird guy always talking motorcycles. Um, so I had that. And then two nights a week, because we had a lot of Canadians on this base, we had our Baghdad Hockey League. So I learned hold to play. On, I on. learned to play ball hockey nice. with Canadians. Wow! Must have been yeah. wearing sneakers and using balls. Yep. Okay. Yep. And if you've ever seen the movie The Goon, probably. Now yeah. I, now I got look. So at that. yeah. So it's it's uh, the guy that plays Stifler. Um, he he ends up playing hockey because he can fight. 
He can't oh, skate though. Stifler's okay. mom. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is the guy banging. No, yeah. no, this is Stifler's son. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, yeah, I became okay. I became like the goon where it's like I will do whatever my team needs me to do. And I would come, I would go back to my room at nights, which is bruises because I would stand in front of guys taking shots, <laughs> even though I wasn't the goalie. And I would stop the ball, you know, with my body. It was just like, hey, whatever my team needs, you know, however I can help them. And after I showed up, you know, about two weeks worth or so, that's when some of the guys started realizing, okay, this guy isn't just, you know, coming around once or twice. This guy's going to keep showing up. We need to coach him and teach him how to play. <laughs> so that's when they taught me things like don't pass in front of the goal. Yeah, right, right. Like, nice. Okay. Sounds nice. good. So, and I, I, you know, being a bigger, older guy, I wasn't fast, but there were a couple of us. There was actually me and this uh, other American we called our defensive line team beefcake because we were just two big guys that it's like, it's hard to shoot around us because we were just two big guys. So, but yeah, so, you know, got to, got to play hockey in, in Baghdad. So it's not badass. a lot of people could say that. You yeah. Know? Just and help then, kill the time and give you something to do kind of oh yeah, my keep gosh. your mind was, busy. You know, yeah. It, and, and it was, it was whatever it was, you know, whatever you could do because the work life balance there, it was, you know, get up, sit in the operation cell for eight hours. But then I had other jobs I had to do. So then I might have to go over to, you know, our secret facility and do some research or do something mm -hmm. over there. And, you know, so there wasn't a lot of time for recreation, but I mean, it was, it was a lot of wake up, go eat, go to work, go eat again, go back to work, you know. So yeah. a lot of monotony and everything. If you wanted to go for a run, we had like one road, that if you did a whole lap, it was a mile. It was like, that's how big our little base was, you know? So yeah, it was, wow. and there was a couple hundred people living there. So it was, it was on top of having that building that you saw that was bombed out, Saddam's old yep, prof headquarters, yep, yep. that was inside our compound. So that took up a lot of space right there. And that was just a bombed out building. Yeah, that's badass that you got to, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, there I it remember is. that, there yeah, it dude. Is. Yep. But you got to be in that. Yeah, you sent those pictures, huh? There's that sticker. Yep. I remember Overlooking we're looking Baghdad at Baghdad right there. Yeah, private Facebook. There, you can group. even see the the cross swords in the background there. Mm -hmm. That you sure. see a lot of, right to the right. Why am I? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, yeah dude. and you see that building under construction. So I mentioned like our cigar club. We'd meet on a rooftop over to the left. Yeah, we'd meet on a rooftop, and we'd always talk about like you know. If somebody just climbed up there, they could easily take us out. Yeah, dude. Yeah. That's always a yeah. nice conversation. Yeah. <laughs> you know, are, might want to think about that. Yeah. You know, here, yeah. here we are sitting on this rooftop smoking cigars like it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, there's some badass photos you shared, though. Yep. Yeah, and that's the roof. So dropped in after they dropped a 500 pound bomb on Fuck. it. Yep. That's crazy, so. bro. Well, I do say uh, thank you for serving. You know how heavily we support our military here. Um, and I always like to say thank you publicly. We appreciate it. Uh, are you going to any of the patron member events this year? So we're just, as we wrap it up here, I want to talk a little bit about this. How about the Eastern Meetup Riding event? Absolutely. Okay. That, that is my plan to be there. Um, again, having lived in that area, once this was announced, I reached out to Russell um, so it's not been like an every year thing, but we have had years where we've had like a patch or last year it was a poker chip, or even when you've done the sanctioned ones, people mm -hmm. have made t-shirts. I am working on a gift for the people that attend this one. Yeah, that's right. You hit me up about this, didn't you? Yeah. yeah sorry. I, I get so busy. Use, yep. Oh, I fuck. wanted to use the likeness of the lab logo. Yes. So sorry. Yeah. I yeah. Permission. So nice, yeah, but I'm working, I'm working on something for everyone that shows up. Um, just, just a little, you know, Hey, you were, you were here for the sixth annual East coast non-sanctioned. Yeah. So, but I mean, it is, gosh. So Russell started this when I was in Iraq and it was so rough not being able to like join him on that one and everything. And I know that was a big year because that was also, that was a Sturgis. No, that wasn't a Sturgis year for you. Mm, I don't remember now. No, because yeah. 2020 was Sturgis yeah, year. I was there right. for that one. But Russell had, him and Mark Arnold met you for the lab meetup. 
and then they did an iron butt back to Tennessee. Yep. And they mm-hmm. did I remember the that uns, or the non sanctioned at the tail of the dragon. Yeah. So that was that was a big one. And then so twenty twenty, my kind of you know, test run before Russell and I went to Sturgis, he and I went up to so year two, it was in Ohio and we did the triple nickel. So it's a it's a nice country highway that goes up through the middle of Ohio, through Amish country and stuff. So that was a great ride we did. And that was uh so me and Russell and Sherry joined us on that and we went up and did that one. That was a great weekend. And then it just on the ride home, it just dumped on us. I mean, it, it shorted out my radio. Wow. Yeah. That's well, damn. It's more a radio problem than a right. bike problem. It was, it was, even though it was marine grade, evidently their definition <laughs> of marine grade and that of an actual marine or different. Was not full so, sum- submersion. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I remember calling and talking to them and I was like, yeah, you know, so I got rained on it. Well, it must have been raining really hard. Yeah, it was. I was in it. <laughs> well, it, you're not supposed to submerge it. I was like, I didn't drive the bike into a pond. You right. know, it was just rain, but your bike, your radio shorted out. And yeah, I, I ended up getting a much better, higher quality radio for that bike um, that had no problem with the rain after that because I got caught in the rain a few more times, even had my uh, heated grip short out one Is time that right? so that it was like burning my hand on a ride. But yeah, so no, the the Ohio ride was great. Um, then we did the Iron Butt out and we met you guys in 2020. Yep. Um, the following year, some of the guys from the DC area did a great ride down Skyline Drive in the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. Um, once again, Russell and Sherry came out and then even Pablo Casarado, mm-hmm. uh, the, you know, all of us met up um, and we went and did that ride. And then I haven't been able to make one work since then. So this will be my first time back since then. So I missed, what was that? Four and five. Mm-hmm. So yes. it, it'll be good to get back and see everyone for this one, for number six. So yeah, we're looking I'm forward. Really looking forward to it. It's yeah. going to be a fun time. If you guys want to learn about this specific one we're talking about, uh, head over. We did a podcast. I did a talking head video on it, and all the information is over at this page. This is the 2024 Patron Ride and Meetup event. Um, it's not uh, technically sanctioned, which means we're not completely organized. It like uh, Anthony said, this is organized by Russell Roberts, and then he's jumping on board and helping. We appreciate that. It's all over at lawbindingbiker.com forward slash. 2024 meetup, all one word, no dashes. Again, forward slash 2024 meetup. There are requirements. There are deadlines uh, for getting signed up for that. And again, we will be there, the lab crew, many of us, uh, but we're really riding the coattails on this one this year uh, because we're going to be in the midst of our 12-day East Coast Club ride over there. But one day we've set aside to do this patron ride. Now there's another event real quick that Brad Johnson is doing. This is non-sanctioned too. This is just the community. Like I've told you guys a lot in the past, this is the community within the private Facebook group. It's growing so big that they're organizing these rides amongst themselves. And this one is going to be by Brad Johnston. It's in Madras, Oregon area, uh, Friday, July 12th, 2024, no host bar at New Basin Distillery. And then Saturday, July 13th, 24. A 2024 ride followed by a barbecue at a patron member Brad Johnson's house. Sign up for him is in the event page in the patron only Facebook group. For that one, he's he's working it through Facebook. Um, the other one, you got to go to that link. And then uh, this one is Chris Lezak, member Chris Lezak. This is the Ashland, Wisconsin area. Again, a non sanction. This is members making these meetup and events. Uh, July 30th and 31st, 2024. Uh, they have blocked out. Uh, they have a block of room set up for July 30th and 31st. Dinner reservations are set for the 31st um, at the Alley Restaurant. Um, there's more information here, but there will be a ride through the backwoods of northern Wisconsin, along with stops along Lake Superior, possibly a few surprise stops. Sign up. Again, he's running it all through Facebook in the event page and the patron-only Facebook group, so there's no better time to become an, a patron, and we appreciate those guys setting those up. I don't know. I know we're going to be at the East Coast one that I mentioned. Uh, it will depend on my obligations this year uh, and travels, uh, whether any of us. And I think even if I don't make like the West coast one, I'm not sure. I know some of the other guys, Popeye and cowboy, you may or may not see some or all of us there, but uh, we'll see as the year 
progresses. And then last we heard, they might be trying a Texas one, but there's nothing official on that yet. Um, but we'll see as 2024 blowing up. Um, I don't know that we've had this many events in one year. So really looking forward to 2024. So we really appreciate you guys uh, hanging out with us on the mic. We got a live episode we're going to get geared up for here in a minute. Um, you know, we love our sponsors. Most of all, we love our patron members. We've talked a lot about them here. The reason is, you know, uh, we want to get to know you better. We want to get you benefits. We want you in the private Facebook group. But if the only way you want to support us right now, for whatever reason, is through a flat donation, we're certainly we never bought at a flat donation. I want to thank the following people. We'd like to thank Felix Perosi of Monroeville, Pennsylvania. Michael Hosenberger of Silver Lake, Washington, right in our backyard. Uh, Alexi Plingman of Staten Island, New York. Bill Davis of Parkton, North Carolina. Robert Falanga of Lakewood Ranch, Florida. Grant Doro of Banger, Sydney, Australia. Hey, big donation. Wow, wow, wow. Large donation. Thank you very much, guys. Lawabidingbiker.com forward slash donate. You pledge a certain amount. Uh, no, that's the patron. You <laughs> Lawabidingbiker.com forward slash donate. Donate helps put a little fuel in the law abiding record gas tank. Keep this thing running on down the road. There you go, guys. Been an awesome conversation with a patron member right here and his wife who gave some zingers. <laughs> they were good, good zingers. Ones. I like it a lot. Uh, yeah, look forward to the next episode, guys. It will be coming out and it's uh, we're going to have them on the mics again. This one's going to be on video, it'll be on the tube view, and uh, it'll also come out in regular podcast format, guys. So, yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed it. It's real uh, biker talk episode. Kind of went all over the place. They're my favorites when I can just, I forget I'm even on a mic. I can't believe we went that long. It's it crazy, quick, isn't it? It? Yeah. it goes quick. That's We're at an hour and, well, about 45, I guess, wow. by the time we started. So, yeah. See, that's the kind of episode I would have loved on a road trip. Yeah. Just listening to this. Yep. We didn't have any emails, Lurch. Nope. We're getting dry on emails, guys. So you guys got to hit us up over at lawabidingbiker.com forward slash contact. Again, forward slash contact. You can leave a message there. You can uh, bust our chops. You can do something. Uh, question. Also, we love to hear your lovely voices on that same page over there. You can leave a voicemail right from your smartphone or computer for free anywhere in the world. And uh, we can listen to your lovely voices. And uh, we'll get it on episode. All right, guys, we are out of here.